Storygram Network. Hosting for this podcast is generously provided by Transistor at Transistor.fm. Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never ever about food or weight. Never ever. Not even. One time. Not ever. Ever ever. Hello everyone, this is Laura Lee from It's Not About Food podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to talk about boundaries. So on the front of the card, the goddess is sitting in a circle. Well, she's making a circle around her and her little dear animal is sitting next to her in the circle. And that's how I think about boundaries is it's drawing a little circle around me. Please don't go over this circle. Don't come so close to me. Don't push back so much on me. If I say I can do something or I can't do something, just let that be okay. So in the back of the card, it says, when we stop dieting and obsessing about food and weight, we set a boundary that allows us to start living our lives and meeting our own needs. Setting boundaries is a way to protect our integrity. By setting limits or saying no, we are able to make choices based on our own unique truth instead of what we believe we should do or should eat or should weigh. And I think about this the many years that I was struggling with boundaries and I was struggling with dieting and obsessing and hating my body and just that whole insane time of my life. And I can remember going to a group for people with eating disorders. And one of the things that they had us do was write this whole list of things that we can do when we feel like we're going to compulsively overeat. So on the list, there were things like take a bath, call a friend, walk around the block, hug your dog, cry. There was all these, well, wonderful things that we could do. But really, what I found in my own recovery is a lot of times I was not eating, obviously was not eating for what I thought I was eating over. But two weeks before then, I had not held my own boundary. I had told somebody I would do something that I didn't really want to do. Or I had said no to somebody and they pushed me until I said yes. It was usually around boundaries, some kind of boundary that I either crossed of my own or someone else crossed. And once I saw that, it's always good to take a bath and call a friend and light a candle and walk around the block and hug your dog. (laughs) But Really, what we're eating over or not eating over is so much more than take a bath. So boundaries was a learning process for me. I came from a family who had no boundaries. There's still people in my family that don't have boundaries now. So I feel like this was a real important tool of my own recovery. And it is something that I still work on all the time of just being able to say no and speak my truth and be okay with that and not give a big dissertation why I can't do something. I saw on a t-shirt, no is a complete sentence. So that is really the truth for me. And so is yes is a complete sentence. I don't need to tell anybody why I've chosen to do one thing or another or not. So I'm so excited today to have Kathleen Bishop on with me today, and she's going to tell you all about her and what she's doing and how boundaries are working in her life. So you're on, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. I took some notes when you were talking because I resonated so much. I'm Kathleen Bishop. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have a private practice in San Jose, California. It's virtual only. I do therapy. I treat eating disorders, body image problems. I also coach for people who just want intuitive eating and body image work, and they've already dealt with a lot of their underlying stuff, and they're just wanting to take it on the road. But I do the more intensive therapy with clients one-on-one, and my practice went virtual due to COVID, and it's wound up being cool because I can see people all over California, and the coaching, I can see people in other countries 
right now. So yeah, so it's my handle on Instagram is body underscore peace underscore liberation. I have a pretty nice little following. And I've considered that my macro work, some of my macro work to, you know, and then my individual therapy is my micro work. And I love what I do. Like I absolutely love bringing people along that get stuck. They're either completely stuck or they're stuck on making that next inroad. And boundaries is often the issue. And when you talked about the self-care things, take a bath or call a friend. I'm like, yeah, I totally agree that <laughs> that has been so overused. Yeah. And, and it's, it's almost like a Band-Aid on a broken leg. And it's like telling people that when they have this deep connection, to, negative connection to food bypasses. It's almost they talk about spiritual bypassing. This is a form of bypassing what's really going on. And I love that you dug a little deeper with the boundaries and talked about not eating enough or eating too much, that there's something underneath that. And oftentimes like people with binge eating disorder will restrict and, and they're compensating by binging. There's also emotional attachment to binging and numbing out. And, and these things and taking a bath isn't going to fix that. It's nice to do. It's good to do nice things for yourself. But first, you've got to feel like you want to do those nice things. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I like what you just said about, I felt like it was condescending to me, like it's overused. At some point, it's don't talk down to me. Don't tell me to take a bath when I'm about to go out of my mind on how much I hate my body or how much I want to eat or I don't want to eat. Don't do that to me. That's ridiculous. That's so simplifying my pain and my struggle. And you also mentioned no is a complete sentence. And I also, I like the one for family that less is more. That when you start getting into a big explanation, you're inviting <laughs> them to, to rip your thing to shreds. As far as I feel like the core of this is learning to feed yourself, which is our most basic need. I'm always telling clients, you got to act like if you were taking a toddler out for the day, you'd never go without provisions. You would have snacks and a drink and you would make sure that you were cared for and that toddler was cared for. And I say, you're the toddler now. Like you need to like give yourself things that are choices that are available in your purse or in your backpack that you can easily get to when you're hungry. And it's almost like clients haven't given themselves that basic permission. No, especially if you're considered to be, or you consider yourself to be overweight in the culture that we live in, you're not allowed to eat. You should never eat. That's what I got. I just did not think it was okay to eat. I should never be eating. And then when I was anorexic, I still had that same thought. So it was so hard for me to eat. And also the negative association. Like if I eat quote unquote junk food, like I deny those things. And then when I get them, I overeat them. And then I hate myself and I ruminate over hating myself. And so for me, taking out the shame part, I'm certified in intuitive eating. One of the things we talk about is the food anthropologist <laughs> is developing almost an observer point of view on yourself and your behavior and just reporting the facts. An anthropologist doesn't go, oh, they're disgusting. <laughs> you know, you ate that, you're horrible. Well, and I also like what you said a minute ago is a lot of times I tell my clients when they say I'm always hungry, it's, are you sure that you're getting nourishment? Are you eating enough calories? Are you eating enough food? Are you eating enough? Because for me, for sure, all of my thoughts about my quote unquote diet, which really only means what I eat and my body were all stuff I made up in my head and pulled from a million different diets and squished them all together. And they were all contradictory, like only eat now and then don't ever eat now and <laughs> only drink water. Don't ever drink water. You know, just eat only meat, never eat meat. I really had no idea what to do once I got some recovery, I started to unpeel that onion. But for a long time, I had no idea I was that crazy about it. And I see clients as they start to get this, like they read the intuitive eating book or they read health every size and they like grab a hold of it. But then they have no idea how to implement it and make it and give it a life. And that's when they find me and find you and find other people. And the beauty is what I see happen over time as people are able to truly 
you know, first there's the physical restriction from food, and then there's the mental restriction from food. And the mental restriction is much more insidious. It's the good, bad. It's the healthy, not healthy. It's the clean, dirty. It's all of that. And that piece takes longer. And I always tell clients, how long were you doing this? Like, how long were you stuck in it? I was stuck in it like 40 years. So it's going to take a minute to unravel this. I compare it to a ball of yarn that's all tangled up. And if you pull the string too tight, you're going to make it worse. You got to go slow and gentle and tease it out. And then it's going to take time when you're rather be going this course than the other. And they often want that. And the other thing I see when people grab a hold of this, they start getting incremental gains and they start getting freedoms and feeling better. And that's when it's almost setting boundaries is a part of the healing. It's almost like a built in part of the healing because all of a sudden things they used to eat over now they can't tolerate anymore and they have to say something and, and they start finding their voice and coming to their own client after client. I've seen this and Evelyn Triboli who co-wrote intuitive being talks about this phenomenon that happens that we all see clinically where people start coming into their own and figuring out who they are and what they like and what they don't like and not caring so much about hurting people's feelings and getting along all the time and being the good girl. And I love seeing people come into their own, but it is a struggle. Like it's not easy by any means. It's not like you just wake up one day and know how to set boundaries. Storygram Network. Welcome to One Media, One Media. I'm when you're whining with nurses. It's a place I like to call The Bleed. My name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. The art of being yay isn't just something he developed. Storygram Network. No. And again, if we look back on our childhood, we can see where even if you had the best parents in the whole world, somewhere along the line, your boundaries got crossed. And especially if you're a girl in this culture or you're sensitive in this culture or whatever. I mean, there's pressures on everybody. So I feel like for me to claim those boundaries or claim the right to put them down, I went against generations of my teaching. We do this to appease the man or get along or to get what we need or to get whatever. I felt like I was taking my skin off, really. I, to say I grew no. up with don't be too competitive and don't be too smart or boys won't like you. And it's like, what? Let them win and don't be too smart. And I'm smart. Like, how do you not be what you are? But I learned to dumb myself down in order to follow the rules. And even the way we tell women they have to sit, like guys sit down and they spread out and women are supposed to take up less space. And there's so many messages that we give. And what I'm loving right now, I have some grandchildren and my daughter-in-law who's training to be an intuitive eating coach, my four and a half year old grandson, like I ask him, do you want to hug? That was never considered when I was growing up. And a lot of grandparents are mad about this new phenomenon, but I think it's fabulous because the kid has some autonomy to say, yeah, I want to hug you. And then, you know, when they're hugging you, they want it. Like it's genuine. They're not little things for us to just take advantage of. I feel like the same thing. I feel like how I was treated as a child, I tried not to treat my own child like that. And my child does not treat his children like that. So the cycle was broken at some point with me. Every generation, maybe we're going to get better instead of worse every time. And the opposite of embodiment is where you just don't have any, you don't even know that you're allowed to draw a circle around yourself. So I call it disruptions in embodiment that happen along the way that need to be healed. A really good example, and there's a person on Instagram, and I forget her name, but her account is scarred, not scared. Oh. She, she's had multiple surgeries and was ashamed of her scarring. And she's a fat activist and she's beautiful and she's lovely. And she talks about setting boundaries with family and that it's abusive what people do to their own members of their family. And she has 
a method that you can use with family. She has a video on her account. I repost it occasionally just because it's so good. And she talks about setting the boundary, saying, you know what, you may not speak to me about my food choices or my body. That's the bottom line. And then people will say, oh, but then they'll just do it anyway. And she goes, okay, so they're going to do it anyway. So you repeat it. And then you tell them, if you keep doing that, I'm going to leave the room. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to take a break. And then when they do it, you have to do that. And over time, they get this gray rock of like, I'm not going to talk about it. And over time, it can be very helpful, but you're taking the action to take care of yourself, even if you live with them, going to your room or doing something. And obviously, if you don't live with your family, it's a little easier to be able to leave because you have your own place. Emotionally, it might not be easier because you put up with that your whole life. And so you think you have to. It's that simple statement. I mean, I've taught clients to say that to very loving parents who cannot stop talking about food in the child's body. I can remember my mother who had Alzheimer's and is dead for many years now. But at some point going through my recoveries, I told her, I don't want to talk about food and weight with you anymore. And, you know, I'm learning how to speak differently about things. And so I'm just asking you not to do that with me. And she said, okay. And then she said immediately, well, can you believe how fat so-and-so has gotten? <laughs> Now, see, that would be what I'm talking about <laughs> right there. Exactly. And she'd go, oh, yeah, okay, okay. I can't believe how much ice cream I ate yesterday. Or what are you eating now? Or are you still whatever it is that she was thinking I was at that time? Again, I realized it, the boundary is for me. She may never obey. And indeed, she never obeyed. Because then she went into Alzheimer's and she'd forget what you were talking about anyway. So that wasn't important to her to do anything about that. But it was important to me. And so the boundary, I set it and I just didn't engage. Or I would, you know, say, you know what, mom, I gotta go. I love you, love you so much. I'll talk to you later. And I just took care of myself because I couldn't control her. Never could when I was teeny and never could when I was adult. And that does <laughs> happen where clients Family members just cannot stop themselves. But again, it's about if you're going to talk about that, I'm leaving or I'm leaving the room. It's, that's not comfortable. And, you know, I want to scream, she's in recovery for an eating disorder. <laughs> what don't you get? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I've told parents this. I only deal with adults, but I get young college students and their parents are very loving and well-meaning, but they just cannot stop. Look at, again, how many generations of women have been on a diet. I don't even know a woman in my family that hasn't been on a diet. So we've been taught this from the time we were tiny and our mother was tiny and our grandmother was tiny. Everybody was tiny. We've been taught that you cannot eat what you want and you can't look like what you do, period. I call it intergenerational dieting trauma, diet and weight concern trauma, because maybe great grandmother didn't diet per se, but she had weight concerns or grandpa had them and he was permeating that throughout the family. I run a group, it's on hiatus right now, but I run a group, an intuitive eating and Hayes group. And um, one of the questions I always ask the participants, was your mother on a diet? Yes. Was your father on a diet sometimes? Was he concerned about your weight? Yes. Was your mother concerned about your weight? then grandparents on your father's side, grandparents on your mother's side. And I do genograms with clients that I do individual work with. And it goes back so far and aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody has dieting or weight concerns. And it really helps the client to see the genogram in black and white because they see that it's not them. Like they didn't just become this way in a vacuum. And it's very liberating to go, oh, wow. You know, it's like, how could I not have turned out this way? Exactly. I mean, if you're raised by wolves, <laughs> you're going to be a wolf. <laughs> you know? You're not going to be sane about this kind of thing. And I can remember my son when he was little, I had an eating disorder. I tried everything I knew how to give him an eating disorder, but he didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't have it. He just didn't get it. But I shudder to think if I'd had a girl, really, because I was so sick. And you see it. It's interesting about children because there was a time when a fat baby was considered a healthy baby. And now people will tear apart somebody's baby for being fat. And you think about like what happens when you're growing is you usually get whiter before you get taller. 
And yep. people zoom in on that and freak out about it. The child freaks out about it. The parents freak out about it. The relatives are commenting on it. This is how children grow. And my daughter-in-law just had a new granddaughter for me. And she has struggled with the after having the baby and people saying, you want to get your tummy back? You want this? And I love it because she posted and she allowed me to share it on my Instagram account. She posted, if you see me and I seem a little bigger than I was before, I just had a beautiful baby and yeah. I'm not interested in your tummy exercises or your tea or whatever. <laughs> I, I'm just going to be taking care of my baby. And I just loved her liberating herself. That was the first baby. And now she's on to the second and she's actually training to be an intuitive eating coach. And she's also a doula. And so she realizes oh, how insidious this is around childbirth. It's like puberty, marriage, childbirth, menopause. These are all times when our bodies change and that's when they target us. Yes, exactly. I have heard people say that to people or I've had clients that say, my mother was saying that I need to lose this pregnancy weight. And I said, do you remind your mother that you just grew a human? <laughs> <laughs> And it takes at least so, a year to get your body back after a baby, like to restore it. Maybe this is what your body looks like now. This is your age. This is your lifestyle. This is what's happened to you in your life. Maybe it's okay. It's the most common thing in the world to become bigger after childbirth and multiple childbirths. It's part of our culture. And yet it's demonized. We have plastic surgeons giving mommy packages, postpartum packages. Think about how many women are told to think about their weight rather than their baby. If you're starving yourself with a newborn, like you're not going to be very effective as a mom. No, but I have had women in a group that at the beginning of the group go, well, I'd like to get pregnant, but I'm afraid of gaining weight. Well, yeah, let's work on that instead of worrying about whether to get pregnant or not. If you want a baby, let's just go for it. And we'll work on the weight thing because that can be handled. You don't have to have that around your neck anymore. It is such a weight. It is such a weight. The weight that women carry. We have just a few more minutes, but I'm wondering, is there anything that you want to put out into the world? You have a little platform right now. And so is there anything that you'd like to say and do or? Well, I'm looking at starting a new virtual group in either late fall, early winter. And I don't start it until there's enough members. And I have a few right now, but not enough to start the full group. I'd like to have six, ideally eight. So that if somebody drops off or misses, it doesn't take away from the group experience. And it's intuitive eating and health at every size and just exploring the kind of things we're talking about and having a safe place and other people. It's a women's group and that goes on the gender spectrum. That's also for people who identify as female. And a safe place. I mean, one of the things that my individual clients would say is I don't have anybody to talk to. And so the group provides, you know, connection and people to talk to. And it's $50 a session. I try to keep it affordable. It's twice a month. So it's, you know, $100 a month. And people who can't afford individual sessions with me often can afford the group. So yeah, that's what I'd like to put out there. Oh, that's so great. I'm really glad that you're doing that. Really glad. So I'm wondering if you will read the bottom of the card that today I will. Today I will practice noticing when I cross my own boundary and by doing something that is not in my best interest. I will question if my actions are based upon my own unique truth or what I think I should do. I will practice setting limits and saying no if needed. Wow. Just if we were to do this, that is a huge shift. And we teach our daughters just to do that and our sons and everybody needs to learn that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you on Facebook. Thank you for listening. You can find me on all the social medias at It's Not About Food. And if you would like to get the show a week early and ad free, you can become a member at Patreon. Search It's Not About Food podcast. Thanks so much.